the rec I work with Dr. Clifford Steer in the Department of Medicine, Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition. And he was presented with a collaboration where um, we could work with almost 400 genomic DNA samples. Um, and the idea was to try to, to segregate a population based on SNP identity. So when I was faced with this challenge, um, my natural instinct for processing things is to go to the definitions. So the, I wanted to try to do this by HRM, so I needed to review what is HRM. HRM is high resolution melting, which is actually the def differentiation of amplicons based on their melt performance. PCA, PCR amplicons are completely melted and rapidly annealed and locked in double-stranded conformation with a dye. The melt temperature profiles are measured as a function of dye release during amplicon melting, and that's how you separate the genotypes. So the key issue is how the amplicons are going to behave during melt. The developments by Roche, since I started with a glass capillary carousel, include that their light cycler 480 has a thermobase block and an optics system, and the plastics that they've engineered and developed are, perform in the same um, standards as my glass capillary light cycler, as far as I can tell. The main difference that, that has developed and allowed me to do this project, though, was in the dye chemistry. Um, so the critical dye chemistry progress in the years that I've been doing uh, QPCR are that the older dyes used to inhibit the, the polymerase progress through the amplicon and copying. And the, la the lack of a dye at a location is a significance. That is a data point. And so if you could not use the dye in saturation, you were generating sort of false positive errors and degrading the amount of data that you could actually collect. The other thing was that the dyes were not locking dyes. The, the dye and the DNA double strands could rearrange during this whole process. And um, notably, nearest neighbor changes, as you'd see in a strand swap situation, were not reliably detected. The current roast dye is used in saturation without inhibition of the polymerase, so the locations without dye are a true data point. It's a locking dye, and amplicons are locked in double stranded conformation until the melt temperature is reached. The dye is not free to jump to another strand, and the strands are not free to rearrange. The nearest neighbor changes are also made obvious. So the next definition in this project that I needed to consider and get myself up to speed with was what is a single nucleotide polymorphism? The goal of the larger project was, like I said, to basically create a Venn diagram of patient outcomes and uh, SNP status. A SNP is a variation of sequence at a single location, and the study of SNPs is at the leading edge of individualized medicine. Individuals are either homozygous for the major gene or the ancestral sequence, which will be designated as AA in this talk, homozygous for the minor gene or the SNP sequence, which will be SS. And heter or heterozygous for a major and a minor gene. And this is just a simple, pulled off of the internet very quickly, um, title for an article, which shows you that accurate, fast, low cost data generation is on the front burner in many labs. So what is a SNP? SNPs occur in two forms, transitions or transversions. In a transition, an AT pair is changed to a GC pair with the loss or gain of, of the hydrogen bond. In a transversion, the sequence at a single location on one strand becomes the codon on the other strand. And they're also that, because of that, they're also called strand swaps. So the theoretical melt profiles that you would see from these rearrangements when you make your PCR amplicons, you anneal them and, then, and you melt them, is that the most distortion and a mismatch, a purine mismatch, is going to melt at the coldest temperature. And the warmest melting temperature, the highest energy input to get the double strands apart, will be at complete complementarity with the triple bond. In practice, we were able to achieve that homozygous peaks for the minor gene and the major gene were clearly different, based on, statistically different, based on melt temperature. And the heterozygous profile was different from the homozygous profile based on peak width. So the AS samples demonstrate heteroduplex and homoduplex amplicon profile overlap. So 
just to, to look at this a little bit differently and a little bit more in depth, what amplicons are, comprise a heterozygous peak? And rather than confusing things with A's and B's and, and C's here, I've used X, Y to be complementarity of one type, uh, maybe the ancestral sequence, and one, two to be complementarity of the minor gene. So PCR will amplify all four of these strands, and then the melting and annealing pr process in the, in the light cycler 480, all four amplicon pairings occur. So complete complementarity occurs in both of these, but mismatch occurs in half of the, in half of the samples, in half of the sample as well. So how to design an HRM assay for a high throughput setting? This seemed sort of like a Rumpelstiltskin project. Mayo de delivered 400 genomic DNA samples, and we needed to do eight SNPs for each. Done in triplicate, we're talking about 10,000 PCR reactions. So of total significance to any assay that you're doing, your data differences must be greater than the intersample variations, and that's simply assay optimization. Assay optimization, you maximize the difference capability while minimizing the contributions of your sample variation, and you need to understand the possible outcomes. Understanding the possible outcomes was the next challenge of this process. Um, the parameters to control in a PCR-based assay are things that will help you, that you can work with that will help you, and things that are going to be a problem. The amplicon length for HRM is usually kept at about 100 base pairs because a mismatch, one mismatch in 100 base pairs will be much more detectable than a mismatch in, say, 500 base pairs. So one in 500 is harder to find than one in 100. The amplicon composition, the percent of GC match, will make a difference. The location of the polymorphism in the amplicon turned out to make an important difference, too. The negative effects on the melt difference is that the variation in the quality and interfering products co-purified with the starting template. And of course, as Dr. Shipley has said, inefficient workflow will get you every time. So amplicon melting is affected by salt concentration, and the differences between the genotypes must be greater than the contribution of sample variation. As I said, these samples were provided to me by Mayo from their laboratory, and a large, large assay, a lot of samples, is the problem of controlling inter-sample variation becomes an issue that you can't overlook. The assay that I worked out, though, is not affected by variation in amplicon quantity because melting temperature is a function of sequence, not in quantity of PCR amplicon that you created. So the selection of primers. Again, as Dr. Shipley has mentioned, there's the standard online method for selecting PCR primers that a lot of people do. And you go online and you put in where you, what you want to, how long you want your PCR amplicon to be, and, and out comes a bunch of uh, suggested primers. Um, because I like to understand what's going on, in, when I put uh, questions, math questions, into my phone and want to know what the answer is and stuff, so, I like to have a feeling that I understand what happened there in the electronic worlds. I, did not, I do not understand what the software does when it designs primers. And because of my personality in this, I, I wanted to test primers because these Protocols also, when they were written, there was never an interest in does, do the primers create something with them that would segregate an amplicon melting behavior. And to know my outcome, um, it, it seems that uh, there's sort of a, you could just start with your PCR primers and hope you find these rare cases, hope you find the heterozygote, hope you find the rare site. But how could you do that? I wanted a synthet synthetic amplification template to test my primers against. So I, needed, I wanted to observe and test the PCR variable parameters. I needed to validate the identity of the melt profiles. And there's something that we probably don't have time for today called spike assay, where if your two homozygous peaks are too close together, you can destabilize the cooler peak by adding the warm, the high temperature melt profile to all of your, to your master mix. And it, it does not affect the heterozygote outcome or the warm 
So what I did for modification, like I said, I wanted to test several primers. I designed four or five primers from each left and right side to create amplicons of about 100 base pairs, and thus approximately 16 primer pairs were, te were tested per template. I also ordered a double-stranded control DNA of about 500 base pairs for the area of the SNP. These were synthesized based on NCBI consensus and used as amplification targets. They, were all, they could also be used to mixed to make a heterozygote sample, but I didn't really find that too necessary. And as I said, they can, the hotter one can be used as a spike. So after I'd picked my primer pair, I went through and did the basic PCR optimization of finding the best concentration of magnesium and the, did my dilution curve with my genomic DNA. These are some example assays that I was able to create. This is a transition profile. So a, in a sample that would be an AT pair, is, it also occurs in a GC pair and GA heterozygotes exist. And we confirmed it with Sanger sequencing. This is a transversion profile where a G and a C, the strand has swapped, and we have a GC heterozygote. And you, in transversions, you always end up with a purine mismatch and a pyrimidine mismatch. So you can see that the melt curve for the GC, mis, this for a transversion heterozygote, melts the coldest and the flattest. This is an example of 96 samples for one SNP in one plate. Um, there's one tracing that kind of went its own way, and there's some empty no-template samples that are nicely called out in bright green. Um, and this is my minor gene homozygote samples and my major allele homozygotes, and the heterozygotes clearly take the wide um, heterozygote melt pattern. It's very easy to, to see that these are, are different, three different categories. Um, you can see that there's some height and that's a representation of efficiency for the different samples. And there's some width to these peaks, a representation of the different salt and contamination intersample variations. One thing that we did not anticipate and was a lovely outcome of this protocol was that unlike a probe-based assay where you have to predict and synthesize and know ahead what you want uh, to, to be looking for, um, we were able in all of these samples to find 12 unique outcomes, and this is an example of it where this sample, the three, the triplicate tracings for it do not follow either uh, the, the minor gene or the, or the SNP or the heterozygote, and I amplified a larger segment and sequenced it, and this sample has two deletions. So some tips, tools, and tricks to survive um, this great big project, besides working extensively with the people at Roche, is as Dr. Chipley has said, pipetting. You need to be able to pipette really well, and you need to have really good pipettes. Um, they need to be calibrated. Electronic pipettes with mixing and dispensing uh, electronic software and capabilities. A 96 well plate turned one quarter turn clockwise turns into triplicate format for a 384 well plate. And I made a very large master mix which was extensively vortexed and, and made very uniform. This is an image of a electronic LED plate loading guide. And I purchased one of these. I didn't purchase this one. This one's showing two plate, the ab ability to do two plates. It's backlit with a red LED which is not um, hazardous to the components of the HRM mix, and it can be you can program it to show one well or three wells or lots of programs, and advance either by pushing a button or stepping on a pedal so that you you know by the time you go get your sample and you look back, the LED knows where you're supposed to put the next sample. And then for plate handling, um, I noticed that a number of the people that I work with are kind of rough with the plates. Um, I used the release liner that, for the foil to put on top of the foil to sp then when I spread out the air bubbles to make sure to not scratch the foil. And I used a cushion to not darken the back of my plate and vortex it even though everything's been mixed extensively to this point. 
I also centrifuge the plate because this is an optical system, so bubbles within there are going to make problems. And everything, every step that you can automate or get rid of steps is always an advantage. So there were some limitations to this assay. It's not going to work for everything. Um, there are SNP specific limitations. We ended up assaying for eight SNPs. We had two more that were in consideration. One of those had more than one minor allele. And we didn't feel that we could separate three possible homozygous peaks and all of the possible heterozygous peaks accurately. So we deleted that, one, that SNP from this, from this type of measurement. There are all, we also had one SNP that was absolutely buried in just a nonsense AT area. And there were no options for placing primers that I was satisfied with. So for both of those SNPs, I would say that then you need to go to a probe-based analysis at the cost of the unique outcomes are not going to be available. There were also software-specific limitations. And I've talked about none of the primer pairs that were finally selected were designed by software. They were all just tested in the laboratory and the profiles investigated. Also, the, the current software f works for traditional HRM applications. But the se and the separation of my genotypes was very obvious, but it wasn't, it's not capable of um, doing the separation. So the solution is that there's, you know, I'm sure the people at Roche are working at a way to, to make these three category uh, selections rather than you going in and hand identifying each of your wells, which peak it's in, which is what I had to do. So, um, with the primers, always test before accepting. Um, the, this is from the paper that I published in Genetic Testing and Molecular Biomarkers. And this is my analysis method. These same 24 samples are shown in all three panels. And this is the current software that I had on my Light Cycler 480 at the zero degree offset, and this is at the five degree offset. At the zero degree offset, the, the software correctly separated the heterozygotes from the homozygotes, but it could not se separate the minor allele from the major allele. This obviously is, a mis is there's not that many genotypes of a SNP in the sample set, and we've validated by sequencing that there aren't. Um, in this method, like I, like I said, I had to roll the mouse over each of these to identify which sample, and it would goes back to your panel on the left on your software and shows you which sample you're looking at and hand record the outcomes. So my conclusions are that through this expanded primer selection criterion and inclusion of the cloning fragment linked double-stranded DNA sequence specific control template, we were able to separate our samples into either major gene, minor gene, homozygotes, or heterozygotes. And there was stati statistical difference and a Sanger sequence and correlation between the groups. Uh, the unique outcomes samples were obvious and can be investigated through further sequencing, like Sanger sequencing. And the HRM melt domains that consider both peak melt temperature and melt profile are accurate. The assay is simple, resilient, and low cost. And these are the people that worked with me at the University of Minnesota, the clinician investigator at Mayo Clinic that provided the genomic DNA, and some of the key people at Roche.